Ghani, over its 30 years in business, has redefined what is possible for the mid-tier and bridge-level brands to accomplish, surviving and even thriving in a position which has seen the fall of so many. But how did it evolve to be so responsible in an industry that is so famously not? Ghani was founded all the way back in 1999 by a man named Franz Trollson. Beginning very meagerly, it started with, in their own words, one-off products like cashmere jumpers and t-shirts that didn't necessarily have a specific design voice but that Franz thought would be cool when sold in his art gallery. It was a registered business at this time, it's just that it wasn't taken seriously, as for all intents and purposes, it was just a hobby for Franz at this point. It actually wasn't until he looked into producing shoes for his brand that he reached out to a couple named Dieter and Nicolaj Revstrup who would change the brand into the industry-changing label it would become. They realized that they had the business acumen and he had the creativity to really make something special. And so by February 2009, Ghani as we know it today would be founded. Because they already had a design aesthetic established because of Franz's previous work, the couple immediately set the company up with a customer profile. They wanted to target the average Danish consumer who is interested in fashion but wouldn't pay six to eight hundred dollars for a basic dress. Their customer was intelligent and confident working in one of the many creative industries. From this, they developed their bridge tier pricing strategy, mid-luxury positioning, their balance of commercial garments and their divvy between entry points and staple products. This was a very clear and well-considered start for any brand, something that came through very blatantly in their first data collection, Spring Summer 2010, that was exceptionally commercial and yet fashionable for the time. It was quickly picked up by celebrities like Claudia Schiffer, on magazine websites like VS Magazine, and even in print in Costume Magazine, Bought and Pleasure, and Cover Magazine. The collection was sold primarily online with their Danish website Gani.dk and at their very first store which opened in Aarhus in Denmark in September 2009. Their garments were purposely at a very affordable price point, especially in comparison to their competitors as shown here in Costume Norway's July edition as a blouse only cost 549 kroner, which is around £40, so a fraction of what their competitors cost and yet they weren't any less quality at all being like a Danish alternative to what Topshop used to be. Shortly after this, they released their unofficially dated pre-Fall 2010 collection, which came along with their first store open in Copenhagen in the department store Illum. The clothes were along the same lines as before, very simple garments that were on trend for the time, very commercial, very inoffensive, as was the Autumn Winter 2010 collection that continued their simple garments, using lots of cotton jersey to produce easy-to-wear clothes that were fashionable at the time. But their one big issue was simply that they were not necessarily distinct in terms of product. However, thanks to this comment, we know that they had their eyes set on a totally different differentiator. From this, we know that at least some of their manufacturing was completed in India in this exact facility that completed the manufacturing from fabric all the way to finished garment. Depending on the company, this can be a comparable manufacturing facility, but by keeping the entire process in one small location, it would drastically cut back on their environmental impact in comparison to so many other brands who may cut costs by having different components manufactured in different places. The scale of this though obviously depends on the brand, but is common from fast fashion all the way up to luxury. And yet I bring this up because their openness about this is what would later set them apart. In short, they seem to have preempted the consumer desire for transparency, setting them up from literally the second full collection as an ethical brand, which saw them differentiate their company in a completely novel way. This subsequently saw them noticed by massive magazines like Elle Norway and a couple of big bloggers at the time who Gani were very keen on inviting or sharing their content well before bloggers were really accepted by the mainstream fashion media. It's really the combination of these two things, their unique differentiator and their ability to drum up press both in a traditional sense and in the rising blogger scene that would carry Gani from season to season as they opened more and more stores. By 2011, they had increased their brand awareness significantly. 
They had three stores, now with the opening of their Odent store in the previous year, and they were continuing with their ethics-based position with philanthropic efforts. But they were looking for something bigger. For Spring Summer 12, really this is the first instance we get the sense of a change in Gani, as they decided that they would finally take part in Copenhagen Fashion Week. They weren't to be on schedule, but they produced this video and hosted their usual party to celebrate the event, which of course would have worked as promotion, but would now also help to market themselves more towards that bridge positioning than ever before. Which in case you don't know what I mean, a bridge brand is something between a mid-market and a luxury brand, and it's something Gani had been aiming for since its inception. So this participation really helped edge them closer to this position, which subsequently saw them have a real explosion of growth. They opened their first standalone store in Copenhagen in 2012 to make a total of four, made their official debut on Copenhagen Fashion Week in Spring Summer 13, by which I mean they participated in their first on-schedule catwalk show as part of a compilation of designers, but unfortunately I couldn't find footage of it. They opened a store in Oslo, which interestingly is their first use of the all-caps Gani logo, though it doesn't appear anywhere else just yet. They had a pop-up in London in collaboration with Anthropology, and they opened another store in Denmark all in the same year. And by Autumn Winter 13, they would stage their very first solo fashion show in Copenhagen Fashion Week. By this point, the brand was very well established in Denmark, and that had started to seep out into the neighbouring countries, even as far as Spain, where they opened what I think was a pop-up store a few months previously. They were also featured in the UK's Guardian, and had caught the eye of global fashionable people like Rihanna, Suki Waterhouse, and Kira Knightley. Dieter and Nicolaj had a vision from the beginning, and they were consistent, focused on retailing and on PR, and it was very clearly working. They expanded to release coats, shoes, bags, lingerie, sleepwear, even leather and suede, which I think are both faux. But it really wasn't until pre-spring 15 that it became noticeable that a small shift was happening with their branding. The Gani All Caps logo was finally featured for the first time in promotional material here and on the lookbooks. Then, by spring 2015, it was also used as the backdrop for the catwalk show that also happened to be their biggest show to date. Gani were no longer just established in Denmark, but really known across Scandinavia as well as having a presence in other countries with pop-ups or capsule shows now going further than the London and Spain ones that we've discussed. This was also boosted by ongoing celebrity endorsements with people like Alexa Chung and Sarah Jessica Parker, as well as of course the bloggers who were still very much welcomed by Gani in this blossoming Gani 2.0 era. As far as I could tell, in this period, there wasn't any one thing or one product that pushed the brand to new heights. They didn't have this definite turning point in their popularity or fame that you may see in other brands. Gani simply continued producing extremely commercial garments at reasonable prices in a way that resonated with their target market that they established all the way back in 2009. It was their focus on their clientele that made all of that not only possible, but lucrative, which is evidenced by their over 400 stockists as well as all of their 21 stores that had opened by 2017 that contributed to $45 million in sales, yet only had 313,000 followers on Instagram, which proved that they knew their direct market and were clearly good at selling to them consistently. Because of this, Dieter and Nicolaj felt it was time to take their brand global. But to do that, they would need a partner, someone that was both invested monetarily, but also who could have a stake in the business so that they would be motivated to help it grow. By the end of the year, their partner was found in L. Catterton, a fairly new company owned by Catterton, which is a private equity firm, LVMH, who you of course know, and Group Arnaud, the family holding company of Bernard Arnaud. Naturally, a group consisting of these three powerhouses comes with considerable industry knowledge, perfect to bring Gani into the future, which is exactly what Nita and Nicolas were primarily looking for, as she very explicitly says in this interview with the Business of Fashion, where she states that they took a long time to find a partner because they wanted to ensure that they were the perfect fit. 
Together, they developed a growth strategy for that bridge positioning that they had been striving for all of this time, which began with a period of consolidation. For that, they would consolidate wholesale accounts to 300-ish, cutting retailers that didn't fit with the company's new, slightly heightened image. They also planned to put more of an emphasis on the company's digital side, which, thanks to the bloggers, had always been a large part of their growth strategy. And they planned to roll out Ghani standalone stores globally to the tune of five or six stores per year, with a focus on the US, which they would eventually enter in 2019. Under El Catterton, Ghani's first collection was Autumn Winter 18 that showed only a month and a half after their partnership was announced. By and large, the clothes were the same accessible commercial garments that they had become known for with the Ghani 2.0 aesthetic that slowly came in starting Autumn Winter 15, but this time, at least in my opinion, the styling was heightened to make these very easy garments more desirable. But more important than the clothes, was their decision to remain in Copenhagen Fashion Week. With LVMH backed money through El Catterton, they very easily could have secured a spot on any Fashion Week schedule worldwide, but instead chose to remain in their original country. Obviously this comes with positives and negatives, but ultimately I think it's smart for many reasons. Firstly, they didn't alienate their already loyal customer base who know them as the big Scandi brand, Secondly, it continues this authenticity that the brand has worked so hard to uphold. And thirdly, they were able to be the big fish in a small pond for the Copenhagen Fashion Week season, instead of being forgotten in the sea of brands in the major fashion weeks where it can be hard to be spotted for any brand, let alone one with such an accessible offering. Their first show together was a real hit, and their trajectory wouldn't slow down anytime soon with Vogue following their Spring 2020 show saying that they put Copenhagen Fashion Week on the map, and that they were the most successful brand out of Copenhagen after their Autumn Winter 20 show. As a whole, their shows had slowly become more and more heightened in terms of fashion offering, somewhat moving along with the times as consumers just expected more wow factor in shows in general. And yet, I don't mean to suggest that they had lost their roots by heightening their shows, because they hadn't. They were just developing along with the times, just not always successfully. Their Autumn Winter 19 show was quite heavily criticised after they used images of women in developing countries as a backdrop. The photos were taken by award-winning photographer of National Geographic, Ami Vital, but because it lacked context, it read to the audience like this was Ghani using these people from developing countries just for aesthetic purposes only reading as very tone deaf because there was little to no mention of how or why these images connected to the brand or to the fashion show. They deleted its filmed existence from the internet, apologised for how it read and claimed that they would aim to do better. But the thing is, Ghani was already doing a lot better than most. As we already discussed earlier with their manufacturing and their philanthropic efforts, which had grown significantly, as we can see from their 2018 responsibility report that details several ways that they expanded on this. It's just, even though people knew Ghani was a responsible brand, they just hadn't been talking about how much had actually gone into it, at least not as publicly as needed to recover from this Autumn Winter 19 show quickly. In fact, it wouldn't be until 2019 that this would become more of a fundamental part of the brand DNA, possibly because of the Autumn Winter 19 show, after which they began voluntarily posting their responsibility reports on their own website in an easy-to-reach and easy-to-read format. In these, they hold an incredible amount of accountability, from things like admitting that they produce a lot of clothing, so plan to take back anything at the end of the cycle, that they had used vegan leather, bearing in mind this was a few years before vegan leather became seen as a negative to some. They talk about giving more traceability in their production, including wanting to upcycle all of their cotton from dead stock, having a responsibility for the waste created after customers are finished wearing a garment, their plastic production, which though is all recycled, in their opinion, could be improved, amongst a variety of issues, including giving things like stoves to people in Nepal and Ghana in UN-approved social products. They also continued their support of women's football and using green energy to power all of their stores. They even go into statistics down at the bottom with all of this still very easily accessible on their site 
four years later in 2023. They actually produce these every year, and it's clear that they still hold themselves to a very high ethical standard, which far surpasses anything consumers expect from a brand. We've discussed a fair few supposedly ethical brands on this channel before, with recent ones being Botter for their supposed activism and Savage Fenty for their inclusivity. But Gani, a company that doesn't consider themselves sustainable, is seemingly doing quite significantly more in a way that's very transparent, but still not milked for PR or performative in any way, evidenced by the fact that they didn't use it to explain away the Autumn Winter 19 scandal. I really recommend giving these documents a read just because there's so many things that they have dedicated themselves to doing over these years and it's certainly nice to see what is possible to do in the fashion business whether or not their competitors choose to follow suit. Though they are teaming up with brands to expand on this, like Aluwalia who produced women's wear collections from waist fabrics and Levi's with whom they had a rent-only collection that Emma Chamberlain was the face of. By 2022, Ghani had grown exponentially. They reached 200 million euros in sales, 40 standalone stores, and 600 stockists. They had conquered an entrance into the American market undeniably and grown quite significantly in Europe, all in the space of just five years, despite it being the same time that the pandemic made everything more troublesome. So now it seemed the perfect opportunity for even further growth. To do this, they sought help for the sale with investment bank Lazard, who valued the company with a $700 million asking price and was specifically looking for Chinese buyers. Though, as far as I could tell, they've either not yet found a buyer or they haven't announced the sale just yet, as nearly every source I could find said that they had multiple interested buyers and that Ghani, El Catterton, nor Lazard could comment. In my personal opinion, going off of how long it took the pair to sell 51% previously to Al Catterton, I'd imagine this is because they're taking the time to make certain that they are going with the right partner. Clearly, Dita and Nicolaj are very good at the business side, and they've constructed a good enough structure with a solid enough customer base to be able to bide their time until they can find a partner that is able to move the brand forward in the ethical way that it has come to represent. Obviously, this is just my opinion, though, and we won't know what, if anything, happens until it does. But that does bring us to today. They just showed the next collection, Spring Summer 24, in Copenhagen Fashion Week, where, once again, they were the star of the entire event. The most interesting part for me, though, was actually the setting for the show. They had several trees that were native to Denmark wrapped around with speakers that linked to an AI tech, that was supposed to indicate the connection between AI and the natural world, bringing attention to their innovation, but also to their sustainability, which is obviously something very important to Copenhagen Fashion Week, as there are 18 minimum sustainability requirements. The collection included everything that we've come to expect from Ghani, like interesting enough fashion, very accessible but still desirable and wearable garments, styled in a way that reads like a luxury ready-to-wear brand. We saw some classic textiles, nothing too extreme, a lot of plain garments, perhaps with a little embellishment here and there, made in their traditional cotton, viscose and recyclable synthetics that I'm hoping aren't blended, as I know that that's something they've been working on from their sustainability reports. Actually, we haven't really discussed Gani's design language much in this video at all, and that's because mostly, apart from evolving with the times, especially noticeable starting from Autumn Winter 15, it's just been really consistent in terms of repeated staple garments with minimal detailing in often plain floral or striped fabrics with some ruching or gathering here and there, all of which we saw in I think literally every collection since then, including this one. So because of that, Gani really has a world of possibility. It's perfectly desirable branding with a somewhat ambiguous and therefore malleable design style while having great messaging and clearly good infrastructure. They're an exceptionally malleable brand for whomever does decide to buy it, and I could really see it going in any direction. They could very easily go high fashion if they brought in a head designer to be the creative force, or they could just as easily redefine the high street to become the more ethical brand instead of the often outright lies that the other high street brands like H&M spout. But there's also no reason why they would have to do either of those things. 
You could argue they're one of the most successful bridge or mid-tier brands on the market today, along with Tory Burch, Michael Kors, with all his efforts of rebranding going quite well, but still received a little bit slowly, and also Diesel, who I do have a video on. But unlike all of these other brands, they're differentiating themselves in a totally unique way that at least for now truly resonates with their customer and clearly has some real longevity baked into their plan. I for one am very excited to see what will happen with Ghani in the future because regardless of how much I predict now, I feel like I'm going to be surprised. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you do like the video, please subscribe and hit the notification bell. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, but about beauty brands, check out my beauty channel. And for early access, my Patreon is linked below.